You might remember last year we looked at uh, John the Baptist uh, and the stories of John the Baptist as a way of preparing us for Christmas. So we spent last year with John the Baptist. This year we're going to spend Advent and Christmas with Ruth. And the story of Ruth is a, it's a beautiful love story. I mean, it, really, it's kind of the fairy tale love story of the Bible. It really is. And, but here's the amazing thing about the story. It's not ultimately a story about two people coming together and finding companionship and finding personal happiness. That, as much as that, that happens, that's not what the story is ultimately about. The story... See, that's what, what's, that's what all the other love stories are about. All other love stories are about companionship and the personal happiness of the people that, you know, enter into the relationship together. This love story is a story about how God works in the lives of two very unlikely people to bring about a greater redemption, a, a redemption that's much bigger than their two lives. It's a story of how God brings hope into a seemingly hopeless situation and gives people who've lost everything a fresh start. That's what the story is really about. And so we're going to look at that this Christmas because there's all kinds of signs of Christmas in the story of Ruth. So uh, let's look at the passage, um, Ruth chapter 1. It's on your handout. It also will be on the screen. And I'm going to invite you to stand one more time as we read the first chapter of Ruth together. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and they lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without, without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. When you die, I, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. 
When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, your word is living and active, and it has the power to change our lives. I pray that you would speak through your servant now, that the good news of the gospel would go forth, that we would have a sense upon our hearts of how real you really are and how much you love us and how much hope there is in your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us now into the truth and that the truth would set us free. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, this passage teaches us three things. It teaches us about the suffering of Naomi. It teaches us about the devotion of Ruth. And it teaches us about the surprising hope of Christmas. The suffering of Naomi, the devotion of Ruth, and the surprising hope of Christmas. Now, the story begins with uh, Naomi and her family living in Bethlehem during a time of severe famine. There was a famine in Israel, and ironically, the word Bethlehem actually means house of bread. Even in the house of bread, there is no bread. And Naomi's husband, Elimelech, uh, he sees these severe conditions that his family is living in, and he decides to move them all to the land of Moab, where he hears that things are not as bad, in hopes of a better life. Now this is shocking, because Israel and Moab were bitter enemies. Uh, It would have been humiliating for Elimelech to move amongst his enemies, not to mention dangerous for him and his family. Why would he do this? Why would he go to the land of his enemies? And the text gives us a strong hint in the names of his two sons. His two sons, uh, Malon and Kilion, those names are not Hebrew names. They're Canaanite names. They were names uh, of the foreign people of, of the land where the people of Israel lived. And when you pair the fact that, I mean, here's the thing. Every, all the Hebrew families, all the, the Israelites would have named their children with Hebrew names. That would have been the common practice. But here Elimelech has given his sons foreign names, Canaanite names. And when you pair that up, with his decision to sell and leave behind his ancestral land in Israel and go to a foreign land, it seems to indicate that Elimelech had turned away from God. He turned away from God and he was in pursuit of safety and security outside of God's protection. For some bizarre reason, he felt that his family was safer in the land of his enemies, than waiting and trusting on God to provide. That's essentially what Elimelech does. So he moves the family to Moab, but while he is there, verse 3 says, he dies. Elimelech dies. And he leaves Naomi with their two sons, Malon and Kilion. But much like their father, Malon and Kilion turn away from God, because they marry two Moabite women. They don't marry Hebrew women, they marry Moabite women, which was against the law. Against God's law, it was against the law of Moses. And after they've lived in the land of Moab for 10 years, Malon and Kilion die. And this leaves Naomi, a poor old widow, living in a foreign land with two foreign daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. What is she to do? She's without hope. 
She's without economic hope, first of all. See, in Moab, Naomi finds everything that her family was trying to avoid back in, uh, back in Israel. They, they move to avoid certain things. They move, they move to a, a avoid death. But look at, look at her now. She's lost everything. She's lost her land back in Israel. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. She has no hope of economic survival. See, you and I, we read it and we go, wow, why doesn't she just get a job? <laughs> it's not how it worked in those days. There's only four ways. There's only four ways that um, Naomi could have survived in that society. The first option was she could work in the fields, but she's too old to do that. The second option was that she could get remarried, but she's too old for that, too. You see, you didn't marry in that society for companionship. If your spouse died, you, you didn't marry because you were lonely. You married to have a family. You got married because you were going to have sons. You were going to have heirs. You were going you know, to have a family. You were going to grow the family and grow the family name. But she's too old to remarry because she can't have children. No man is going to want to marry her. She can't bear, she can't bear children. Her third option was her children would support her, but her sons are dead. All she's got is Orpah and Ruth, and they're no good to her because if she moves back to Bethlehem, they're outcasts. They're Moabites. Nobody's going to hire them. The last option Naomi had would have been to sell her land, but she has no land. She her, Elimelech would have sold their land before they moved to Moab. That's the only way they would have had any money to make the trip. So, here she is. She's got no husband, no sons, no land, no way to survive. She's completely without any kind of economic hope. But here's the other thing. She's not with, just without economic hope. Naomi is without emotional and spiritual hope. She lived in a world where there was an expectation that you might lose a husband at a young age or you might lose a child. That's one of the reasons they used to have so many children. And the life expectancy wasn't terribly long. I mean, it was only about 40 years old. So there was always a chance that you might lose a husband at a younger age. It was very common. But here's the thing. You expected to lose maybe one of them. You didn't expect to lose all of them. Her life has completely fallen apart. She has lost everything that would have given her any kind of spiritual and emotional meaning. As we've already hit on, in that society, family was everything. Family was everything. It was all about the family name. It was all about having children and, and passing on an inheritance. It was all about improving the family's social position and economic position. A woman's worth in that society was primarily determined by her ability to bear children for her husband. And a woman's sense of self-worth was completely wrapped up in her ability to have children and have a family. Now, here's an important distinction. The Bible's not saying that that's right. It's just saying that, that in that society, that's what it was. If a woman could bear children and especially bear sons, because sons were the ones who, you know, did all the cheap labor, the ones that worked, then that was a big, that was good. So for women, you know, t see, in our society today, for you ladies, it's all about your, your dress size. In that society, that didn't matter. It wasn't about your dress size at all. It was about how many children could you bear. They didn't care about dress size. They cared about children. And here's Naomi. She's got no husband. She's got no sons. She's got no family name to pass on. She has no land to pass on. She has no inheritance. She has nothing. Everything in her life that would have given her any kind of emotional meaning or spiritual meaning is gone. She has nothing. And she even says it in verses 20 and 21. Listen, she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. 
I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord has brought misfortune upon me. Now, the reason she says don't call me Naomi is because the name Naomi means pleasant. And the name Mara means bitter. She says, don't call me pleasant. I am not pleasant. I am bitter. (laughs) That's essentially what she says. Don't you dare call me pleasant. I left with a family, and now I've got nothing. And here's the thing. (laughs) Not only is she bitter, the text gives every impression that she's not even talking to God anymore. She's talking about her situation. She's talking about the fact that God has made her life miserable. But she's not not talking to him. She's not going to him in prayer. She's just mad. She's just bitter. She's not going to him. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt mad at God because of your circumstances? You ever been bitter? towards God about your circumstances? You're so mad, you're not, even t- you're not even praying. You're not even talking, you know? <laughs> you're saying, God, God and I are not talking right now. <laughs> you ever felt that way? Now, although, although life has hit many of us really hard at times, there is probably... You know, realistically, there's probably nobody in this room that had it as bad as Naomi. She lost everything, and all she can do now is go home, is go back to Bethlehem. You know, she, she has nothing back in Bethlehem. She has no family. She has no land. She has no property, but she has nothing where she is in Moab. So she might as well go home and be with her own people and have nothing back there. So she sets out with Orpah and Ruth back to Bethlehem. And somewhere along the journey, we're not quite sure how far they got, but somewhere along the journey, Naomi turns to her two daughters-in-law and she says, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Why would you come with me? Naomi looks at the situation and she sees there is absolutely no future for Orpah and Ruth with her. There is no future back in Bethlehem. She knows that the truth is her Moabite daughters-in-law will probably, uh, there's a potential that they might be raped, they might be killed. And she says, listen, go back home. Go back home. At least there's a chance for a future. You might still be able to get remarried um, and still have a family and just go home. And, and, uh, And of course, Orpah kisses Naomi They're weeping together, but Orpah kisses Naomi and she returns back to Moab. But Ruth clings to her mother-in-law. She will not leave. She will not let go. And see, in the story, we don't just see the suffering of Naomi, we see the, the devotion of Ruth. We see one of the most powerful pictures of loving devotion in the entire Bible. I don't, I don't know if there's really a story in the Bible that just really grips us with so much loving devotion as the story of Ruth and Naomi. And here's what we see about um, the devotion of Ruth. Three things in her devotion. First of all, we see her devotion to Naomi. Verse 14 says that she clung to her. She cl- I mean, this is, this is a picture. She's, she is not letting Naomi go. She is like, I am not going home and I am not letting you go. She insists that she's going to go back to Bethlehem with Naomi. Now, this is, all, this is nothing short of amazing. And here's why. Because Ruth knows, Ruth knows that if she goes back with Naomi to Bethlehem, there is nothing but poverty and hardship that awaits them. She knows. I mean, she's not dumb. She knows how society works. She knows the situation, the dire straits that they're in. If she stays in in Moab, there's a chance that she could still have a family. She's still young. She hadn't had any children yet. We know that she's still young in the story. Maybe a man in Moab would marry her still. She could still have a family, still have a nice life. But she knows if she goes back to Bethlehem 
All that awaits her in Bethlehem is incredible rejection, potential violence, and extreme poverty with Naomi. That's all that awaits her. And here's the amazing thing. You see, Ruth is the one immigrant who moves to a new land, not expecting a better life, but a worse life. Why do people leave their country and immigrate and go to a new country? Why? In hopes of a better life. You don't, you don't leave home and move somewhere else. You don't move to a strange land with new people. You don't leave everything behind to go on to a worse life. You leave home because there's the prospect of a better life wherever it is you're going. Why do so many people come to Canada? It's a better life, you know? And whenever you ask them, tell me your story. Why did you, you know, why did you come? I came to Canada for a better life. Every immigrant says that. Nobody says, well, you know, things were good back home, and I thought I would just come and live in squalor here. No, nobody says that. But Ruth is the one immigrant who leaves her home, not just, you know, risking it. She knows that she has a worse life waiting for her. But here's what she knows. You say, why would she do that? Because she absolutely knows that Naomi will not survive on her own. She knows that if Naomi goes back to Bethlehem, she will perish. She's not going to make it. There's no way. And Ruth's love and, and devotion for her mother-in-law drives her to sacrifice a better future in Moab for a life of rejection and poverty in Bethlehem. There was such a bond between Ruth and Naomi. There was such love there that Ruth can't bear the thought of allowing Naomi to go back and perish. She says to her, in her words, here's what she says. She says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Ruth says, if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. You're not going to die alone. Is there, a, friends, is that not just the most moving picture of devotion that you have ever seen? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But we see not only Ruth's devotion to Naomi, we see Ruth's devotion to God. See, Naomi says to Ruth, she says, listen, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Go back to your people. Go back to your gods. And Ruth says, no way. No way. I don't want my people. I want your people. I don't want my gods. I want your God. And in verse 17, she says, May the Lord deal with me. Now here's what's amazing about that statement. Anytime in scripture, anytime in the Old Testament where you see the word Lord and when it's referring to God, it's always in small capitals. Small capital letters. If you ever notice that in your Bible, it's always L-O-R-D in capitals, right? And the reason that it appears that way is because the, the name Yahweh in the Old Testament, the name of God, Yahweh, was to be, believed to be so holy, they felt like they, they couldn't even speak it. They couldn't even say it. That's how holy it was. And so they always used the word um, Adonai, or Lord, right, in its place, but it always appeared in capital letters, and that meant that was the name of God. That was the covenant name. And by taking on the covenant name of God, Ruth was saying she worshipped and served Yahweh. She, she doesn't just say in a generic way, may God deal with me. She says, may Yahweh, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates us. And friends, this too is nothing short of amazing. Think about it. Naomi serves Yahweh but Naomi's lost everything. She blames God for taking everything good in her life away. And Ruth has witnessed Naomi lose everything. She's seen, you know, Naomi lose her, her husband. She's seen Naomi lose her sons. 
She sees that Naomi has nothing, and she still wants Yahweh as her God. Why? Why? (laughs) What, What does, why would, you're looking at somebody who worships a certain God and who's bitter at that God, saying, this God has taken everything away from me, and Ruth says, that's the God I want. This makes absolutely no sense. But, let's pause for a second. Why would she want Yahweh as her God? Here's what I think the story is telling us. She, even though she sees a woman who's lost everything, even though she sees that Naomi is bitter and feels that God has done this to her, here's what she sees. She sees a woman who refuses to curse her God and she sees a woman who refuses to abandon her God. And Ruth sees a woman who loves her so much that instead of demanding that her daughters-in-law would come back to Bethlehem with her, desires that they find a better life and future. In other words, what Ruth sees is the selflessness of Naomi in a situation where Naomi had every right to be selfish. You know, she totally could have played the guilt card, couldn't she? She totally could have played the guilt card on Orpah and Ruth. She could have said, listen, I'm going back to Bethlehem and you've got to go with me because if you don't come, I'm done. She could have easily said that. She could have easily just thrown that guilt on them, right? Right? And if, and, if, and if either one of them had said, no, you know what, we're going to stay here with our family. You want to go back to your people, you go ahead. We're going to stay here because we know that there's no life for us there. Naomi totally could have said, if you don't come, I'm going to die. And she doesn't do that at all. She, instead, is not looking out for her own well-being. She's looking out for the well-being of her daughters-in-law. And she says, go back home. You'll, there's a better life. There's nothing that waits for you in Bethlehem with me, except poverty and probably death. Ruth looks at Naomi and she says, that's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of person I want to be. And if worshiping Yahweh has made Naomi that kind of person, then even though he's taken everything away from her, I will worship Yahweh too, even if it means I lose everything too. Now some of you right now are thinking, That's just stupid. You're saying, I am sorry, but I would not worship a God who would take everything away from me, who would do anything to people like what he did to Naomi. That's just stupid. Hold on a second. The sermon's not over. If you think I'm trying to say, look at Ruth, just be like Ruth, Just be devoted to to people and to be devoted to God like Ruth is. That's what we need. We need more Ruths in this world. If you think that that's what the sermon's about this morning, you're not seeing the point of the story. See, because not only was Ruth devoted to Naomi and not only was Ruth devoted to God, Ruth's devotion is pointing us to an even greater devotion. It's pointing us to the devotion of Jesus, it's pointing us to the person of Jesus. See, friends, there is a greater Ruth. There's a greater Ruth, there is one, there is one who looked down from heaven and saw, not only saw our suffering and our brokenness, but left heaven and came down to do something about it. See, like Ruth, Jesus Christ chose poverty in Bethlehem born to poor parents in a barn, lying in a feed trough. He chose poverty in Bethlehem over the riches of heaven, over the comfort of his heavenly home. See, like Ruth, he left his heavenly home with the expectation of a worse life on earth. He wasn't, he knew, he wasn't just risking it. He, he comes, Jesus comes knowing that what awaits him ultimately here is rejection and poverty and execution. See, he not only comes expecting to be treated like an outcast, or sorry, like, you know, he doesn't just come uh, expecting to be treated like an outcast, but literally becomes an outcast. 
taken outside the city, crucified on a cross. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. He leaves the safety of heaven and comes down into poverty. See, Jesus doesn't just say, I don't want them to die alone. I'll go die with them. Jesus says, I don't ever want to be separated from them. I will go die for them. I will die so that they will never be separated from me. See, Ruth goes with Naomi, not sure that she can save her, but willing to try. Jesus Christ comes to us with the promise that he will save us and the power to do it. It meant his rejection. It meant his suffering. But his devotion to us, friends, is absolutely undeniable. You think the picture of Naomi's de- or Ruth's devotion is a powerful picture? Look at Jesus. Look at everything he lost. See, like Ruth, the action of Jesus comes to us in many ways, as a complete surprise. See, Christmas is about the unexpected and surprising hope of Jesus bursting in to your life and to my life and to our world and into our broken lives. It just, it surprises us. It just bursts in. Just when we think that all hope is lost, there's Christmas. There's Christmas. Just when it looks like all hope is lost, there's Christmas. Uh, one of my favorite books ever written is C.S. Lewis's classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I love that book, and, and many of you have heard me use illustrations from that book before. But one of the things I love in that book is um, C.S. Lewis describes the land of Narnia. He says, it's always winter but never Christmas in Narnia. How horrible would that be? Always winter, never Christmas. I don't know about you, but Christmas is like what gets me through the winter. You know, it's like when it starts to get cold and this, this you know, and we get Snowvember, like we did a couple weeks ago, you know, and, it, and it's like Christmas kind of breaks that up because you know, it's like it's tolerable because you know Christmas is coming. And in Narnia, it's always winter, but it's never Christmas. That's how Lewis describes it. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's word, Aslan's on the move. The true king is returning. He's coming. And you know what starts to happen? There's all kinds of signs that it's true. You know why? Because the the snow starts to melt. And the ice starts to thaw. And spring starts to arrive. Aslan's on the move. And what Lewis was doing is he was right, he was trying to create a picture of the hope of Christmas. He was trying to paint a picture of what it meant that, that Jesus breaks into our world and Jesus breaks into our lives. And in the same way that, that Aslan's arrival in Narnia meant hope for Narnia and everybody living in Narnia, Jesus Christ's birth means hope for us. G- Christmas means that there's hope for your life and my life when things fall apart. Look at Naomi. Look at Naomi. She's lost everything. But she hasn't lost everything. You know why? Because she's still got Ruth. She's still got Ruth. (laughs) The verse tells us, look, Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth. And she, Naomi says, I, I went to full, I left full, but I have lords brought me back to empty. You know what? It's not true. She's got Ruth. See, Ruth sees Naomi. She sees the need of Naomi. She, she sees the desperation of Naomi. But here's the thing. Naomi doesn't see Ruth. She, she can't see Ruth. And friends, you know, for those of you who feel like you've been in that spot where you've been hopeless, you don't see hope. Even when there is some, it's like you can't see it. Here is Naomi, and she's going back to to Bethlehem. She's still got Ruth, but she can't see Ruth. 
She can't see the hope that's in Ruth. But see, Ruth sees Naomi, and Jesus Christ sees you, and he sees me, and he sees our need, and he meets it by giving himself. See, we don't always see him, but he sees us, and that means that there's hope even when life falls apart. Christmas also means that we have a God who is with us in our suffering. He's with us, Emmanuel, God's with us. See, Jesus Christ doesn't simply look down from heaven as you and I slug our way through life. He enters into our mess. He gets his hands dirty. He becomes vulnerable in the the form of a baby, susceptible to all the same things that you and I are susceptible to. And in his life and in his death on the cross, he endures the ultimate physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering. He knows exactly how you feel, exactly how I feel. He's been there. See, Naomi complained that God had afflicted her, but Jesus knows what it's like to experience the ultimate affliction. My dad once said to me, I was complaining to him on the phone that I was having a bad day or a bad week, and he says, son, he says, you will never have a day like Jesus did. You will never have a day. And you know what? Immediately that put things into perspective for me. He is present with us in our suffering just like Ruth was present with Naomi, except his presence is even more comforting, it's even more empowering, it's even more encouraging than any human being's presence because you know why? We always have it. We always have it. But... The story of Ruth and Naomi shows us that God's comforting and empowering and encouraging presence comes to us through the lives of other people. It comes to us through people. See, as much as Naomi tried to send Ruth away, don't you think that she was ultimately encouraged that Ruth came with her to know that she wasn't alone? All of us know the comfort of a friend's presence in a difficult time, don't we? When, thing, when life just feels horrible and I don't know how I'm gonna get past this, but man, I'm glad I've got this person. See, if we have a God who is with us in our suffering, then to be like God, if we're gonna talk about being like Jesus, then to be present with others when they suffer is what it means to be like God. We need to walk with others amidst their suffering and through their pain. See, Christmas is not just a call to look up and see that we haven't lost everything. It's a call to look up and see those who feel like they've lost everything. And then to walk with them and walk beside them. Friends, here's my question to you as, at this point. Who are the Naomi's in your life? Who are the people who are brokenhearted, feel like they've lost everything, feel like they are walking through life empty-handed, who are those people? Who are they? Are you walking with them? Who can you be a Ruth to? What does it look like for you to be a Ruth to somebody this Christmas? You know, for, for some people this Christmas, this is the first Christmas without a loved one. It might be the first Christmas without a job. It might be the first Christmas Um, without children at home because their children have moved away. Who are the Naomi's in your life? Make a point to be present with them this Christmas season. And lastly, Christmas means that we have a God who is absolutely devoted to us. As we've already said, you see, Ruth's devotion was pointing to a greater devotion. It's pointing us to Jesus. Christmas means that God is so devoted to us that he would come down and die to ensure that we would never be separated from him, ever. But not only is Christmas about having the assurance of God's promise to never leave us and never forsake us, it's about renewing our devotion to the people around us, too. If God is so devoted to us, we ought to be devoted in every single one of our relationships. We need to be devoted in our marriages. We need to be devoted to our parents. We need to be devoted to our children. We need to be devoted to our friends. Friends, is there a relationship in your life right now where you have stopped expressing devotion? Where your devotion is now provisional on the other person's devotion? 
So you're saying essentially, I will, be lo- I will love you and I will serve you and I will be devoted to you to the extent that you love and serve me and are devoted to me. Is that what you're doing? If you do what you're supposed to do, I'll do what I'm supposed to do. You know, this is what happens in marriages and other relationships all the time. You know, one spouse stops doing what they should do and what they promise to do in their vows, and the other spouse starts to shut down and says, that's it, you're not getting anything until you start to give. And then it just gets worse because the other spouse is doing the same thing and it is down and down and down and down we go. And it happens between parents and children. It happens between friends. You're just taking. You're not giving anymore, so guess what? You get nothing now until you start to give. But the gospel says that Jesus Christ was loving us and devoted to us when we were anything but devoted to him. In fact, when you and I were busy showing our devotion to all kinds of other things that weren't him, he was busy expressing his devotion to us by dying on a cross. And he calls us to have the same devotion in all of our relationships that he has for us. See, remember when I said, you know, you ought to... Some of you thought the sermon was, just be like Ruth. You know, just be devoted like Ruth. Friends, you will never be like Ruth until you get a Ruth. Until you realize who your greater Ruth is, Jesus Christ. And when you continue to look at his unwavering devotion for you, that will fill you with strength to love and serve people who aren't loving and serving you back, who maybe promise to be devoted to you but aren't being devoted back, and it'll give you a resource to be devoted to them. See, until you see that there's hope for your own life, you'll never know how to bring hope to anybody else. You'll be bitter like Naomi. You'll be bitter at God, you'll be bitter at other people, and you'll be blind like Naomi to see the hope of God in your life. Friends, do you believe in Christmas? Do you believe in the greater Ruth who came and died for you? Christmas means that there is hope hope even when life falls apart let's pray God this is an amazing story an amazing story of a woman losing everything and another woman walking beside her and staying devoted to her in a moment when she had every right to walk away Lord how amazing it is this, that this story points us ahead to what you did at Christmas. What you did in the same land, the land of Bethlehem, when we who were in utter spiritual poverty, you came down and you embraced poverty yourself so that we might have your glorious heavenly riches. God, how we need our lives to be filled with that hope again not the wishful thinking that things will somehow work out, but the assurance and the certainty that you have not abandoned us and that even when it looks like we've lost everything, we still have you. We still have our greater Ruth. We still have one who's making a way through all the horrible mess of life and bringing something new. May we glimpse your son, Jesus, today and all that he has done to express devotion to us and know that even in amidst our suffering, that you are indeed God with us. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.